you're being bugged and bothered by men giving you attention, can I have an aha here? It's something from your past. That's a major aha. I don't think I've ever said that. If you, now that you've dropped the weight, if you are bugged and bothered because men are holding the door open for you or being polite to you or speaking to you or a coworker is speaking to you now and you're like, oh, well, you didn't speak to me when I was fat, then you don't deserve my, my attention now. You don't deserve my friendship now. You, you know people who say this. And if that's what you think, you're asking for the past. We're reading chapter four. The statute of limitations has expired on most of our childhood traumas. This is gonna be a big slap in the face for some people, you know? And, uh, and it's hard. And I'll tell you why, it's because so much, we are so identified with our childhood traumas. You know, I don't know why I'm not identified with my whole refugee story. Mostly because I didn't have anything to do with it. I didn't know any better. My dad had to go through that. Maybe he's still scarred from the war, Vietnam War and the refugee stuff and leaving his family. He never talked about it, so I couldn't tell you. Maybe, I mean, more memorable than that is being picked, in six, picked on in sixth grade for wearing peach polyester pants. Hand me down pants from Goodwill, but that's okay. I'm not identified by it. Maybe I am. Poor Asian immigrant, you know, skinny Asian, strong Asian. Oh, I forgot to look that up and see if strong Asian was available. The statute of limitations has expired on most of our childhood traumas. I read this last night, it's so powerful. The stories of our lives, far from being fixed narratives, are under constant revision. Isn't that so true? Like we retell the story, but sometimes we retell it differently. Someone brings in another clue. No, that's not what happened. Oh, I remember that, but it was slightly different. This happened and this, and, and, and your stories are under constant revision. So I don't know why we're so tied to these stories. The slender threads of causality are rewoven and reinterpreted as we attempt to explain to ourselves and others how we became the people we are. As I listen to these tales of the past, I am impressed by the ways in which people connect the things they experienced as children to who they are today. So what do we owe our personal histories? Certainly we are shaped by them and must learn from them if we are to avoid the repetitious mistakes that make us feel trapped in a long running drama of our own authorship. Our own fucking authorship. We wrote the story. This is why in the initial stages of psychotherapy, it is important to listen to the patient's story uncritically. Contained in those memories are not just the events, but also the meaning they have for that particular person. Since the story is being told by someone who is anxious, depressed, or otherwise dissatisfied with his or her existence, one is likely to hear about grievances and traumas that are presumably in some way connected to current unhappiness, right? We have these past grievances that still cause us current unhappiness. Every adult American has been sufficiently exposed to pop psychology that he or she is inclined to connect past difficulties to present symptoms. Because acceptance of responsibility for what we do and how we feel requires an act of will. It is it's natural to blame people in our past, especially parents, for not doing a better job. It requires an act of will to change, you know? If there has been serious physical, sexual, or psychological trauma, it is important to acknowledge and process this. No child escapes unscathed from parental abuse or neglect. Every verbal thing, every little thing, every little pat on the butt, every spanking, I mean, it even times out, I guess. No child escapes unscathed. What is important is to go about this examination sympathetically in a way that emphasizes learning but rejects the assumption that even the most awful experiences define our, lo love, define our lives for
forever. So we must reject that assumption. Reject the assumption that even the most awful experiences define our lives forever. I reject it. Not forever. You know, it does not define me forever. Next page. Change is the essence of life. It is the goal of all psychotherapeutic conversation. Change. In order for the process to proceed, however, it must move beyond simple complaint. People often ask me why I don't get bored endlessly listening to patients whine about their lives. The answer, of course, is that complaining about how one feels or about repetitive behaviors that produce familiar and unhappy results is just the beginning of the process, dude. You're just getting started. My favorite therapeutic question is, what's next? In an act of consummate subtlety, subtlety I have a screensaver on my desktop computer visible to patients with these words scrolling. What's next? The question implies both a willingness to change and the power to do so. What's next? Interesting. Maybe that should be a new mantra for us. What's next? Right? It bypasses the self-pity implied in clinging to past traumas. Isn't that interesting? I, you know, sometimes like we talk about past traumas and, and bad hurts and stuff like that. I never thought about it as self-pity. Isn't that interesting? It's self-pity, huh? It bypasses the self-pity implied in clinging to past traumas and recognizes the importance of leveraging goal-oriented conversation, insight, and a therapeutic relationship into changes in behavior. I don't give much direct advice in therapy, not out of modesty or as a trick to get patients to come up with their own solutions to problems, but because most of the time, I don't have a clear idea of what people need to do to make themselves better. I am, however, able to sit with them while they figure it out. My job is to hold them to the task, kind of like this tribe. Point out connections I think I see between past and present, wonder about underlying motives, and express confidence in their ability to come up with solutions that fit their lives. A kind of training takes place. People often come into therapy hoping that I will be a source of sage direction on what they need to do. After all, we go to doctors to get prescriptions. We are trained to expect quick solutions. Feeling bad? Take this. The idea that we have to sit and talk about the problems we face and the things we have tried that have failed implies a slow and unwieldy process that has at its core an uncomfortable assumption. Here's the key to the entire chapter. This uncomfortable assumption. We, you mofo, are responsible for most of what happens to us. We are responsible for most of what happens to us. There is a narrow line that a ther this is my top one of my top five books. There is a narrow line that a therapist must walk here. All of us have endured events and losses about which we had no choice. These include the families into which we were born, the way we were treated as children, the deaths and divorces of those close to us. It is not hard to make a case that we have been adversely affected by events and people outside our control. I had a thought while reading that. I flashed to the ranch. I was like, I gotta remember to bring this to the ranch. And I totally forgot where I was reading. You ever do that? And now you have to go back and reread it? Attempts by therapists to reorient the conversation to future choices may be perceived by the patient as unfair and judgmental. Here's where the importance of the therapeutic alliance is greatest. The patient must be convinced that the therapist is on his or her side. Therapy properly done is a combination of confessional, we're almost done, reparenting and mentoring experiences. I never thought about therapy like that. Reparenting. Think about that. Hey, you guys, you guys, most of y'all have gone to therapists. They're thinking about reparenting you. And then they also mentor you. 
There is no perfect therapist for all who seek help. Each person has individual needs that cause them to fit well or poorly with a given therapist. In addition, the therapist brings his or her life experiences, prejudice, and philosophy of change to the process. Often the attempt to connect is futile, occasionally even harmful. Just as with any other human relationship, what works is frequently hard to define or predict. The qualities of a good therapist mirror those of a good parent. Patience, empathy, capacity for affection, and an ability to listen non-judgmentally. See, I, was, I would not have been a good psychiatrist. I, I, at the time, ability to listen non-judgmentally? No, I listen to judge you. It's only recently that I try to do the non-judgment. But I, it's still, I it's still a struggle, man. That said, just as parents react differently to different children, so too do therapists do a better job with certain patients. What all of us hesitate to admit is that we tend to be more helpful to people who are like us. This seldom acknowledged prejudice makes logical sense. None of us would be very effective therapists if we were dropped in a foreign country, even if we spoke the language. A subtle combination of cultural mores and expectations would escape us. I think it's funny, the word more is more, M-O-R-E is more. M you put an S on it, it's mores. So too, within our own society, people live very different lives depending on, for example, their race or social standing. It is arrogant to assume that any of us can work equally well with everyone. I think this is my problem when I was a young bariatric surgeon. And I was in my own insecurities about not knowing everything I needed to know about bariatrics, nutrition, etc. Not knowing what to say. Like I tried to bulldog a bunch of people and it just did not turn out well. Uh, especially when I was going through my financial struggles. When someone first comes to me for help, one of the things I ask myself as I begin to know him or her is whether I like or will come to like this person. Your therapist has to like you. <laughs> if I find myself bored or offended by a patient's story, I know it is time to gently suggest that he or she might work better with someone else. For example, I find a sense of learned helplessness, highlight that, we talked about learned helplessness, if it seems intractable to be hard to work with. Me too. If I find that I am providing most of the energy and optimism, I, you know, it's so weird. I would not ever think of uh, therapists as optimists, but I guess they need to be, huh? Or if I'm losing hope for change, it is time to stop. If the person I'm seeing reminds me too closely of one of my own parents, of a person with whom I have had conflict, or of a girl who rejected me in adolescence, I know I am in dangerous territory. You know, I, I, as I got older in my career, surgery career, and I found a few patients, rarely, but a couple times a year, I would find patients that were just, you just weren't going to please them. We're not going to make them happy. And I would just invite them. I would tell them, like, I think you need a better surgeon than me. I think you need a better surgeon than me. You know, I recommend this, this guy down the road. He's excellent. You'll really like him. And that's what I used to say. I used to storm out really angry and tell my office manager, fire her. I don't want her as a patient. For him, he's terrible. Last paragraph. Finally, if the person I'm talking to appears wedded determinedly to the past and unwilling to contemplate a better future, unwilling to contemplate a better future, I grow impatient. It is misplaced kindness to offer only sympathy even where it is clearly justified. It is hope that I'm really selling. That's what I'm selling to y'all. I'm selling to y'all hope. Hope of a better life. Hope of a better outcome with your surgery. Hope with better finances. Hope with better relationships with your mom or your, your grandmother or your kids. Hope is what I'm really selling. If, after extended effort, I cannot persuade someone to buy, I'm wasting both our time by continuing. You know, this is why we journal. You know, this morning we were journaling and I was telling y'all, you need to write it, the future thing you want. 
five years, three years, one year in the future, even tomorrow. You ride it like it is today. I am grateful and thankful that my plane ride went smoothly. My plane was on time, no problem. I got to Albuquerque safely. You ride in the present tense. You might only have, you know, two dimes in your bank account, but you write, I'm grateful and thankful for the thousand dollars in my bank account, the ten thousand dollars in my bank account, the million dollars I raised to buy the ranch, you know. You write it um, because read the, I'll read that sentence again. Finally, if the person I'm talking to appears wedded determinedly to the past and unwilling to contemplate a better future. If you are unwilling to contemplate a better future, then your weight loss surgery will fail, your diet will fail. Think about that. Why are you trying to lose weight? Can I have an aha here? Why are you? Why did you have weight loss surgery? You want a better future. Why do you want to drop these hundred pounds and avoid surgery? You want a better future. It is a bigger aha. So if you think the future, if you're wed to the past, if you just cannot contemplate a better future, oh, that's nice for you, Dr. V, but I have to work. Oh, but, but you don't know what it's like to be 400 pounds. Yeah, but you, your mama's not sick. If you will not, cannot even contemplate a better future, you are at high risk for failing your weight loss surgery. You're at very high risk for regaining weight. Because even if you lose the weight loss initially, and you're not contemplating a better future, you will go back to the way you were. You know, like you cannot, you know, you're going through rough times as you drop the weight. Maybe your husband gets jealous, your significant other gets jealous, you, your work demands more, you know, men start holding the door open for you. I, I don't know why that bothers women. Like, that, like, dude, I wish more men would hold the door open for me. Like, I would like it. So, but, for whatever reason, it bothers some people. They, they make excuses about it. And I'm like, dude, that, that was your past. You're being bugged and bothered by men giving you attention. Can I have an aha here? It's something from your past. That's a major aha. I don't think I've ever said that. If you Now that you've dropped the weight, if you are bugged and bothered because men are holding the door open for you or being polite to you or speaking to you or a co-worker is speaking to you now and you're like, oh, well, you didn't speak to me when I was fat then you don't deserve my, my attention now. You don't deserve my friendship now. You, you know people who say this. And if that's what you think, you're asking for the past. So you cannot contemplate a better future where people are just fucking polite. That you can fit through a door. That, you know what I mean? I think self-sabotage is a made-up thing, but it, it's a real made-up thing. It's a real made-up thing. It's an unnecessary made-up thing. Tommy Thompson will hold the door open for you. Dr. V will hold the door open for you. John Clark will probably hold the door open for you. I'm kidding. He would. For sure. Nice guy. You know, these are all nice men. You know? Um, so, Joe, Joey Lorenzo would do it. Papa capping you. You know? No, they don't. Guys do not expect things in return. A stranger, I do not expect anything in return. That's made up, Margaret. We make these up. You hold on to the past. You know, you hold on to the past. And that's it. Like, this willingness to contemplate a better future. And to do that, you know, today's talk is about staying guard at the door of your mind, you know. You are what you do, was day two. You're not what you think, you're not what you believe, you're not what you dream, you are what you do. I hold a door open for Erica, or a stranger, male or female, I try to get there, hold open the door, hold, hold open the elevator, because I'm a nice guy. I manifest being a nice guy. Does that make sense? Don't expect anything in return. I try to meet new people because I know Grant Cardone said strangers have everything you want. They have everything you want. You know, you know, if you want more money, if you want to raise money for a ranch, it's from strangers. In fact, everybody I raise money from, everybody I raise money from for the ranch was a stranger. I never, I've never met them in person. 
Not a single friend or family gave me money. Unless you call Tess a friend. Because I had met her before. A secret knock. Right? Like no close fam family members. So it's, it's a stranger. A stranger with everything you need. Oh no, I just have my husband. That's all I need. At one point, mofo, your, your husband was a stranger, was he not? You needed love. You found your husband. A stranger had what you needed. Think about that. I need to find a parking spot. There's a dude in a vest standing next to the podium. He's a valet. He has my parking spot. That sounds silly, but it's true. You know, I want good service. Here's the waiter. Better tip him up front. A stranger has what you need. Now eventually, you make the stranger your friend if they're worthwhile, which takes me back to today, which is staying guard at the door of your mind. Not everybody's meant to stay in your life. Sometimes, you know, the things I guard in my mind is much more important. So if I come to realize I thought somebody was gonna be cool, they're not cool, I'm like, no. Turns out the Corvette is fucked up. They're like, it's horrible. It has a huge vacuum leak, it needs a tune up, it needs like the spark plugs are all different colored wires and duct tape together. And, um, and something about heads, that never sounds good. The engine heads need to be replaced. $5,600. I'm like, what does that mean? They're like, dude, it, it dies when it's idling. You, you gotta give it gas for it to go. The engine heads are shot. I was like, what? So I messaged the guy who sold me the car, who I said, who's a business owner. And, 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 I, and I said, we're gonna be friends. I texted him, I was like, dude, my mechanic says the Corvette is trash. It needs a lot of work. It's gonna be expensive. It's got all this, no response. So that goes to tell you, it doesn't matter. I still, it's still, even with the repairs, I will not have lost everything. I'll have a primo. Mwah. Now I won't have like, <clears throat> I won't have like the, um, the, uh, what's that called? The gains, the capital, the, the value. But I'll be break even with the repairs and I'll have a Corvette that's primo. But he and I might not be friends. Especially if, um, if he doesn't respond to me. But he might be like, I don't need him. Or, or he might be embarrassed, I don't know. Or I like, he kept, I kept saying, hey, can you drive it to my, uh, Mechanic, I want a PPI for that price, you know, pre-purchase inspection. He's like, well, I don't have insurance on it. I really don't want to drive it. <laughs> now I know why. That's okay. I should have learned a long time ago to get a PPI. But what I learned was every time I get a PPI, I can't buy the car. <laughs> what I realize now is that I need to, if I like the car, if it's a lot of money, I'll get a PPI. But this isn't that much, you know, like the Cadillac's $22,000, it's not going to break me. But there's value in that car, I'm not going to lose much more than that, even if I have to put 5000 in the Cadillac. We were talking about the Corvette, but I switched to the Cadillac. And, um, and what I realized is that I'm just going to have to put money, if I want the car, I'm going to have to put money into it, like all of these cars have money, require money. Only question is, can I get it for the right price? So I'd rather just haggle and knock down the, the price and get close to where I was going to be or need to be and then build it back up. Now, I might be a little upside down on this Corvette, but I'm not going to move my shirt. I mean, come on. I spent $237 on sushi by myself. I bought dinner for uh, five of us the other day. It was $500, you know. So what's, what's another $100 or $1,000? It's... And I get to enjoy and drive it and, you know, spend time um, Googling. Anyway, staying guard at the door of my mind. My mind is more important than this relationship with this guy who sold me the Corvette. Especially if, I mean, he's had four heart attacks. He's 48. He's younger than me. He had four heart attacks. His teenage, his grown up sons are sitting in his house, like smoking pot, playing dominoes. Show me the car, and I don't know, he's running around, like, you know, maybe we're not meant to be friends, it's okay. 
This is more important, guys. This is more important. And, and now I know what motorheads are for. 